everybody uh, to our APEX series. We're really pl uh, proud and pleased to actually have this as uh, the committee, and I believe that everybody, you know, they, you know, Jack DeMond and Vanessa Patrick, Jason Porter, um, Don Patterson's group, who chairs the uh, Faculty Senate uh, Community and Government Relations. They're all the people that always work on trying to find the best and brightest assistant professors here at U of H to uh, give a talk. And uh, for those who do, don't know who I am, I'm just a starter. I'm in the pre currently the president of the uh, Faculty Senate, and I will be paroled in January. So after that, I don't have to worry about it. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, have uh, Daniel Paris, Dr. Daniel Paris, to come up here and introduce our speaker for today. Thank you very much. All right. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Suzanne Pritzker, um, and I'd like to welcome you to today's timely and fascinating talk on understanding and building political engagement along, among millennials. Before we begin, um, I'd like to briefly introduce Dr. Pritzker's work. She, be, she began her professional career as a policy advisor for the Virginia Secretary of Education and, at, and as an analyst for the Virginia General Assembly. With a frontline view of the policymaking process, she de developed a passion for educating and empowering vulnerable populations to participate in and influence public policy development and implementation. Her scholarship investigates how youth become civically involved and on practice interventions to incre increase their engagement. Her research is focused on the impacts of interventions such as community-based participatory research. Among her many accomplishments, she has published 16 peer-reviewed manuscripts, four book chapters, and several policy and research reports. She has also widely disseminated her work locally, nationally, and internationally. She coordinates the Austin Legislative Internship Program and the Policy Insider Series on campus, a collaboration between the GCSW, GCSW Alumni Association, and One Voice Texas. This work has resulted in a big impact on the community and on the social work profession. In 2014, she was named to the Rising Star class of 2014-2015 by the Houston Area League of Women Voters, and in 2013 was recognized nationally as one of the 10 dedicated and deserving social workers by Social Work Today. Thank you for coming today, and without further delay, I'd like to um, present Dr. Pritzker. Thank you, Dr. Parrish. I'm really excited to speak on this topic today as the country gears up for our next presidential election. So I wanna start with this picture. This is not me, but this could have been me. Um, as a child, I always looked forward to election day so that I could go to the polls with my dad and pull the lever. Even as a precocious adolescent, I remember fighting with my father, a lifelong federal employee who was always concerned about being seen as engaging in visible political activity because I desperately wanted to post campaign signs in our front yard. I was one of those kids who couldn't wait to vote. In fact, I turned 18 one month after the 1992 presidential election, and I think I complained about that for about a year. I really wanted to get to vote in that election. So for me, political engagement was something that we all did as part of our obligations as citizens. It didn't make sense to me to, to, to behave in any other way. But as I became more involved in professional policy work after college, I grew increasingly aware of the lack of political public involvement in policy decision making and the disconnect between policymakers and the communities for whom they make policy. Through these experiences, I became increasingly interested in understanding the processes by which young people develop their civic identities, the civic gaps that exist, and identifying strategies to overcome these gaps. So I want to show you a series of headlines uh, that have appeared over the last year. The millennial dilemma, are they bored or ignored? Let's set the world on fire. The youth are passionate, opinionated, and barely aware of the election. Millennials don't matter much in American politics. And one of my favorites here, why young people don't vote, part apathy, part frustration, part ignorance. In the first paragraph, hey you, yes you millennials, stop twerking for a second and listen up. <laughs> this might come as a huge surprise, but there's this massive midterm election quickly approaching that's only two weeks away. Are you going to vote? No, Obama's not on the ballot this year. That's why it's called a midterm election. And he's already been elected twice. So what's that? You don't care enough to vote? Why not? So 
very negative characterizations of millennials here. They're bored, apathetic, frustrated, angry, ignorant, and just don't pay attention to the world all around them. The very few positive statements in these headlines don't take away from the overall negative message here. What message does it communicate to you? Some of you are millennials in this room, but all of us is a potential youth voter when you turn on the news or flip through news sites or social media and see a constant barrage of stories that suggest there's something wrong with you for not voting. Does it make you want to register, run out and register to vote? Does it make you feel confident and interested in participating in the political process? Does it make you feel like your opinions and preferences matter and will be heard? My own working hypothesis is that this barrage of negative messages doesn't fuel youth participation, that shame doesn't produce youth participation, but in fact, it may do the opposite, communicating that electoral politics is not a welcome environment for young people. So before I go further, I want to talk about who are millennials, okay? First of all, millennials are the generation younger than Gen Xers, so younger than me, but where the endpoint is, is not universal. The Pew Research Center suggests that the generation ends at those born in 1996, so those who are 19 years old, and, um, so ending at those who are 19 years old now. But Howard Strauss, the folks who coined the term millennials, end the generation at those who are born in 2004, so kids who are 11 years old right now. So there's a a lot of difference in who we think are millennials um, in general. And truthfully, generations are often not determined until we move far away, uh, far enough into the next generation that we can see some sort of distinction here. Um, so when I talk today, I'm gonna kinda talk both about adolescents who are about to be ready to vote and current young voters. So why does this matter? Why are we so concerned about millennial youth, millennial political engagement? So first of all, millennials, and here I'm talking about ages 18 to 29, make up one-fifth of all eligible voters in the United States. However, they're represented in much lower rates. So in 2012, young voters, a fifth of all eligible voters, 20%, 21% of all eligible voters, constituted just 15.4% of the votes cast. So a real distinction between the share of the population and how, how much they're actually voting. Part of why this is important as, as this these charts show um, are that different generations have different political interests and orientations. So if we look here, what we can see are that, for example, millennials are far more independent than older generations, whereas about 27% of the silent generation, the oldest Americans, 34% of boomers, 42% of Gen Xers identify as independents, 45% of millennials do. Dem it's interesting, on Democratic identification, it's about the same across the board. But then if we talk about Republicans, 34% of silent generation are Republicans, 27% of boomers identify as Republicans, 24% of Gen Xers, and just 18% of millennials. So we're looking at a different group here. We're looking at a generation that identifies partisanly differently, but also has, therefore, different political interests and orientations. So if there's disproportionately low political participation, electoral participation, there's, that means that these particular sets of views are underrepresented in the policy process. Now, and I wanna point out from this, we often hear this idea that people get more conservative as they get older, and so that some of this will change. But if you look at these charts, it's not really so much what's happening. And so what we're talking about is a different generation that looks different politically. So why else does millennial participation matter? Well, we know, while we know that political activity does increase with age, there's also a consensus both in political science and developmental psychology literature that election-related behaviors are habit-forming, meaning when young people vote or engage in other political activities, they're likely to do it again and again and again. So if millennials are engaged now, they're going to continue to be engaged. And finally, I think another reason why this is so important is we actually know that young people can serve as role models for older adults in their households as far as political engagement goes. So studies, even of high schoolers being engaged in political learning and mock voting activities at school, with studies have found that when they come home and talk about what they've learned about elections, they talk about their excitement about candidates, that actually their parents vote more as a result. That engaging young people really has a ripple effect on their families. So by further engagement in millennials, we could be talking about broader engagement in the population as a whole. So the headlines that I shared with you, this idea that millennials are apathetic, that they're bored, that they're disinterested, that they're lazy, that they just don't care, does this match the reality? 
So I want to share a few key data points that I think are rel relevant to understanding young people's participation. First thing that's important to know is that youth ages 18 to 21 did not have the right to vote universally in this country until 1972. So the data that is relevant is post-1972, okay? So since that point, the top two lines are, are, are non-youth, or so older adults, and the top bottom two lines are either 18 to 24 or 18 to 29 year old citizens, okay? So right here we see, I can show on either side, but there's, this gap has been going on the entire time since 1972. Young people have always voted at lower rates than older adults, regardless of generation. So those headlines, they make this sound like a millennial problem. This is not a millennial problem. This is a young people thing, right? Baby boomers, those of you out here, you weren't participating. Gen Xers, we weren't participating, and neither are millennials. So this is not unique to millennials at all, despite the rhetoric. Um, the next thing that I want to point out is that the entrance of millennials into voting age themselves, so millennials when they started voting, in 2004 and 2008 showed a clear trajectory upwards. What we were seeing is not these millennials that are less engaged than others in prior youth generations, but actually millennials that were more engaged in electoral and voting, okay? In 2008, this was the second highest youth registration and voting rate since 18 year olds have been allowed to vote. The only one higher was the first year. And I can imagine there was probably a lot of excitement in 1972 and a particular incentive to go out and vote at that time. So in 2008, we're talking about an 18 to 29 year old range that's represented almost entirely by millennials. And that's the second highest youth voting we've ever seen. Doesn't match the rhetoric here, okay? 2004, more people voted, more young people voted in that election than all the four elections, 1972, 2008, and that 1992 election that I missed by a month. But other than those, 2004 is a pretty active year too. Okay. Now in 2012, and then in the 2014 midterm election as well, we saw a, a pretty substantial drop. 2004, 14 in fact, was the lowest youth turnout ever in a federal election. But what I want to make clear here is we don't know yet which is the aberration. We don't know if that rise in 2004 and 2008 tells us that we actually have a more politically engaged Young, young population, and that 2012 and 2014 have something to do with unique factors to those elections, or if 2004 and 2008 are the things that are kind of odd and we're going back down to a lower participation. We don't know. We'll know more next November, but we don't know right now. So to suggest that millennial participation is at a particularly low state we don't know. We've seen a lot of evidence that millennials are actually pretty, pretty involved compared to other youth populations. The next thing that I want to emphasize is that when young people register to, the vote, to vote, for the most part, they do. Okay? So this chart, the red line is percentage of registered voters who turn out to vote from 18 to 29 in presidential election years. 78 to 80% of registered voter, young voters vote. So registration matters. So once you're registered, you vote. Now in midterm, in midterms, this is not the case. This is, we're looking at more like 50% of registered voters. Now in general, we know that lots of the, the general population is less likely to come out to vote in midterms. We know that Republican voters are more likely to come out in midterms, and we saw that not so many millennials are Republicans. So it kind of fits. But what we're looking at is in 2014, only 46.7% of registered millennials voted. So, so that, that does raise some concern. It's also important to know that in um, that millennials don't vote in local elections either. Now, local elections, the US population as a whole doesn't really like to come out and vote for say a mayoral election like we have right now going on in Houston, um, but this is even rarer for young adults. So I think those are all important things that we need to know in terms of looking at these headlines and understanding what's going on. Do I have a question or should I say it's you save it to me. Okay. Thanks. Write it down. No. Um, but I think it's really important if we're under in understanding participation about millennial youth. I see a lot of promising signs. I see things that are not inconsistent with youth before. But I think it's also important to look at some of the particular barriers that millennial youth may face to civic engagement and how these may impact participation. So for one, millennials are more diverse than prior generations. Research, including some of my own, suggests that low income 
immigrant and some minority youth may face specific barriers to civic participation. For example, in some low-income minority communities, there are often fewer community civic institutions. So there's substantial work, um, Robert Putnam, for example, the book Bowling and Alone that some of you may have heard of, um, work by um, Ted Scoble as well, talk about these lack of organizations, institutions, and communities can really have a ripple effect on decreasing political participation. And in, in low-income communities, this is, this is often the case. There's also, there are also less opportunities for civic education in schools. Schools have often been a place where we learn about how government is structured, how participation happens, and these are becoming less and less prevalent um, in a lot of schools. When you look, for example, at what, what subjects students are tested in a lot, and therefore what we teach in schools, social studies falls to the bottom of the list. We focus on reading and math and science at times, but rarely social studies, and so we see the impacts in schools when we do this. Extra or Add-ons like service learning, for example, which has been linked with civic engagement, are generally less prevalent in low-income communities as well. Often we see limited family access to civic information. Um, parents and immigrant families, research have found that often parents and immigrant families feel very ill-equipped to model and discuss civic responsibilities with children. So we're also talking about in, in this in a much more a, a generation much more represented by children who've grown up in immigrant families that their parents who may have come from other environments political environments don't necessarily feel comfortable modeling what democratic participation in the United States would look like. And I think the other thing that's important when we're talking about, about a very diverse population is the role of youth experiences of discrimination and marginalization. Literature is really mixed in this area as to whether these are limitations for engagement, whether feeling marginalized, discriminated against makes you not want to participate, or in fact, if it's an incentive. If feeling like you're being kind of excluded makes you, rattles you up and makes you want to do something about it. So there's some evidence in both directions we really don't know yet, but this is something we also need to think about with this generation. So how does this play out? Given this diversity, I think it's really important, and a lot of my work is focused on looking at racial and economic disparities in participation. So first here, we see it in terms of who votes. Okay? Among youth, actually African American and white youth, they vote um, substantially more than Asian and Latino youth do. So we see some of the gaps. We're talking about just over a third of Asian and Latino youth who really turn out in the last presidential election. So there's clearly some, some issues, some disparities going on here. My research um, and others have found consistent racial and ethnic differences, both in voting and in other forms of political behavior among young people. So this is some data from a study that I did um, several years ago with a sample of Houston high school, high school students at several very diverse high schools. And what I asked them is a whole series of political behaviors, so moving on beyond voting, and asked about their, whether they had done these activities over the past year. And what I found pretty consistently, so in, on these charts, the, Hispanic, the Latino population is the orange. Okay? And if you look at most of these activities, Latino high school students are less likely than other racial and ethnic groups to engage in a real array of political activities. So not just voting, but wearing campaign buttons, engaging the media to express political views, expressing political views at an event, the only place really where there was significantly higher Latino high school participation than other, other youth is in protests, marches, and demonstrations, which kind of fits. There have been a series of immigrant-related immigrant protests, um, and I think this is often a path used by immigrant, immigrant youth, um, immigrant millennials particularly, to engage in political activity. But there are some, there's some pretty noticeable, I think, uh, civic gaps here. And this is consistent with my own prior research, my own dissertation research, for example, where I looked at a national data set and found that Latino adolescents across the country repo reported the lowest or next to lowest involvement on every measure of adolescent political behavior that I had identified, and that I examined, and more negative attitudes towards civic involvement. So we definitely see some differences, and we have a, the largest Latino population on the largest Latinos have a large share of millennial population than what we've seen before. So I think that this is a piece of what we need to be looking at. There are also stark differences in terms of participation based on both household income and educational attainment. Poor, less educated young people vote and participate in political activities at lower rates um, than, than more wealthy or more educated youth. 
its findings are consistent across the literature, including in my dissertation and subsequent research. Um, and I wanted to show this this ch chart here. Um, this is this data was collected by a national, the leading national research um, research center on civic engagement on youth civic engagement circle, and they compared um, looking at young voters by educational attainment. And what they found overall is that in 2012, 66% of youth with any college experience voted, compared to 35% of youth with no college experience. That is a substantial gap that if you've been to college, two thirds of youth are likely to have been able to vote, to vote whether you've completed it or not, and certainly if you completed it at a much higher rate. Um, but youth who don't go to college, only 35% of them were turning out to vote. Other challenges that I've come across um, in my own work. So unlike my own unique experiences growing up in the inner suburbs of Washington, D.C., many of us don't grow up surrounded by political debates and living next door to political appointees. We aren't all encouraged to engage in facilitated political debate in our classrooms, in our high school classrooms. We don't all have parents who have the right to vote, the time, the knowledge, or the experience to model democratic participation for. For many low-income and minority youth, civic role modeling is hard to come by. So Circle, the research center that I mentioned, they found that non-college attending youth exhibited substantial awareness of social and political issues. What I'm talking about is very different than what these headlines say, that, that millennials aren't paying attention. They are paying attention. They are interested. But then they reported that they didn't know how to get engaged in making change, whether through voting or other activities because they lacked civic role models to show them how. They weren't seeing other people in their communities engaged in making change and influencing politics, so they didn't know how to do this. Well, my own research with Latino high school students in the East End here in Houston identified a similar concern. So I did a uh, civic intervention uh, program with a group of youth, um, at a, a group of adolescent high school students at a high school near, near campus. And we did a, youth, a program called Photo Voice, which is often used in community-based participatory research, but is, is a tool where essentially kids go out in the community with cameras and they take pictures of their community, and then they go through a structured program where they analyze these pictures. They look at what are these pictures tell you about strengths of community, limitations of, commu of your community, opportunities for strengthening your community. And then they pulled all these pictures together and made a presentation to community members, community leaders, and policy makers. So the idea here is that this is going to give them an opportunity to present their ideas about community, about changing policies and structures in their community. So when this was over, students were excited about ways they could influence the community. They, at the end of the intervention, my data showed that they, they, were, they were pumped up, they had efficacy, they felt like they could make change and they wanted to. And then several months later, I did focus groups with these kids. And that wasn't what I saw anymore. I didn't see excitement. I didn't see students who were really ready and seeing themselves going out and making change. And so I asked why. And this is an example of a quote. We as high school students, we see that, whatever the problems are. We are going to try to do something about it. But adults who have more experience in how they can, they see more, but they don't do anything about it. It's just, it's sad. What these kids were talking about is they wanted to go out and they started to go out and try to make change. And the models, the adult models in their community, the teachers and their parents weren't supportive of them, weren't engaging in activities, in, in civic activities themselves, but in fact seemed disinterested. It was the adults that seemed disinterested, not the adolescents. I'll say it again in this quote. And the, one of the students is talking about trying to organize some of her friends and adults for, for a community change effort that she was doing. And when it came down to it, a lot of the adults backed out. So that cut me off at resources, and that was I was like by myself. That discouraged me not to do it. So I think that my research backs up what, what Circle is finding too, this idea that potentially not having civic role models in communities can be, uh, can be a, a detriment to building civic engagement in, 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 in low-income and minority communities, particularly in immigrant communities as well. But I think it's important that when we talk about why people don't participate, to also look at some of the policy challenges. So this chart also from Circle um, explores reasons why millennials and older adults do not register to vote. So I want to be clear here, to some extent there is indication of apathy. About 45% of unregistered millennials say that they didn't register because they're disinterested. 
I don't want to point something out here. This is the, the longest line out. That percentage is almost identical for millennials and older adults. There's nothing different there. We have a population of Americans who are disinterested in voting, not just young people, adults. Okay? This is an important concern, but this is not unique to young people. Where there are key differences here in this data is that almost 25% of millennials report not registering in 2010 because they missed the registration deadline or did not know where or how to register. So a headline writer might look at this data and say, well, they're ignorant. See, they don't know where to go and register. They don't know what the deadlines are. But I think that this may also reflect real barriers for young adults. We know that young people move around more frequently, which requires regular re-registration. I've lived in the same house for six years. I don't have to keep re-registering. I don't have to pay attention to when registration deadlines are. Okay? Young people often have less flexible jobs that don't allow them time off to vote. I can go leave in the middle of the day on Tuesday and go vote. But young people often are not in jobs where they can do that. And we also know that there are increasing registration and voting barriers being put into place. Um, Circle found links between voter ID, shortened time periods for voting in some states, and in some states, repeal of same-day voter registration. There were links between all of those barriers and lower voter turnout. Even in a generation that has higher technological proficiency than, than many of those older folks, um, so old, but older than they are, um, than millennials are, basic information about how to register, where to vote, who your elected officials are, can be incredibly challenging to find. So several weeks ago, the Graduate College of Social Work held a voter registration drive. And students came up to me um, as they were coming by the registration booth said, I live on campus, and I have no idea where I'm supposed to vote. Okay? This wasn't just this year. I heard the same thing at our voter registration drive last year. I don't know where to vote. Students don't know. That information is not readily accessible. I know that our university sometimes sets up a voting place for students in presidential election years, but they don't. that information is hard to come by. Students can, also talked about how confused they were about whether they were still registered to vote. They knew they had vote, registered several years ago, but they moved and they weren't really sure if they were still registered. Kind of a fair concern. Do you have to re-register every time you vote? That's a little hard to make sense of. The answer is yes, but they are every time you move, but, they, but, but, but that's hard to track, right? And again, I don't move so regularly, but, but students do. In one of my policy classes every, every year, at the beginning of the semester, I give students an assignment where I ask them to identify who represents them at their particular address at all levels of government. Students fill this out, they talk about who they fill out, who are their county commissioners, who are their city council members, um, and then we talk about it in class. And I can't tell you how many conversations we have about how hard it is for students to figure out who represents them locally, how hard it is with all the technological proficiency to figure out who your county commissioner is, to figure out if you live on kind of odd little borders of districts, who is your city council member? Yes, there are some tools, but these tools are not easy. They're very hard to follow. And you know, I tried this to grade their assignment. I go on and try to find out who represents them too, and I see how hard this is, right? Yes, if you are registered, you get a card, but if you've moved, if the card didn't come, if things happen, it's hard to figure all this out. So I think we really need to think about how difficult we make it for young people to get the kind of information they need to be able to figure out where to vote, how to vote. So to summarize so far, millennial voting doesn't differ that much from youth of earlier generations. There's actually some signs of promise above and beyond other youth generations in 2004 and 8, but also some discouraging signs recently. And there's also some challenges that we need to think about. Um, but I really want to focus here now, on this rhetoric of youth apathy and disinterest, but whether there's still accuracy here, or because we talk about it in terms of voting, or whether there's something else going on. So in the last decade, some scholars have sought to move our understanding of young people and millennials' political behavior beyond the vote, arguing that young people are communicating their preferences publicly in a variety of ways, that even if they're not voting, there are other things that they are doing, that this is a pretty engaged generation. And some of you out here, millennials, may be thinking about your own work that you do and your own activism. And that these things may be, these activities may be ignored by headlines. So I want to highlight a few terms that are coming out of the literature. So the top of the slide 
is some of the key terms that scholars are using to describe what they think is going on with young people instead. They may be some of their what's called non-traditional. Traditional behavior is voting in elections and things around elections. But that there may be some of this non-traditional political behavior going on. Political voice behaviors, which are about expressing your opinions politically. Self-actualizing, cause-oriented activities, focusing on political consumerism, trying to influence how companies behave, activism, emerging activities online. So I want to highlight, and these, these pictures on the bottom highlight a couple of these examples of what, what, is, what scholars are talking about, what, what we think we might be seeing. So on the left is a picture um, from change.org. So I'll tell you in, in, in full disclosure, when, when my students come and they're planning, we do, I do, they teach a lot of advocacy courses and we talk about what their advocacy projects are. And when a student says, well, I wanna do a petition, my gut response is a petition, like a, a few of your friends are gonna sign this, nobody's gonna pay attention, can you pick up the phone and call your representative, maybe vote next time? That's my gut reaction, but I'll tell you what, this is a 13 year, this example is a 13 year old girl who petitioned to get the Illinois governor to veto a bill making plastic bag bans illegal. Just put a petition up there. 174,817 signatures later, the governor vetoed this bill. Okay? So this is an example where youth are engaging in something that maybe sometimes we're not, you know, we, we sort of question. And this 13-year-old girl made a difference in policy in the state of Illinois. And this is not the only example. There are lots of examples. We now have a president who actually responds to change.org and we the people petitions and has to. There's pressure that he has to respond to these online petitions. On the right is an example, is an article about Black Lives Matter. Okay, and look at this headline. These teens and 20-somethings are organizing the civil rights movement that will change our country. What we're finding in Black Lives Matter is that young people are playing a key role in leading protests around the country and spreading the message through social media. Hashtag Black Lives Matter, which is being used to organize this movement across the country, that was created by young people. That was created by millennials. So that this, this, this creation, this activism, this create using online technology, these are some examples of what we're talking about. So, as someone who is a lifelong believer in the power and the crucial nature of the vote, I hesitate, but I also believe these scholars have a point. Voting is important, but it isn't the only way to communicate political preferences in a democratic society. So I would argue that these forms of political engagement can influence policy in and of themselves and that they may serve as pathways to voting. So instead of sort of saying youth are passionate but they don't care, youth are passionate and they do care. Let's look at how these can serve as pathways to voting as well. So in some of my research, I have found preliminary evidence of a path, of a connection between political voice participation, this expressive activity, and electoral participation. Not a lot of research is looking at this yet, but can these be pathways to also voting? So in my own work, um, I've, never, I've done a lot of different studies and haven't really pulled them together. Um, until until preparing for this so this is an example of this is this this chart captures three different studies i've done of, of youth around their political participation the blue line is youth as college students at an elite private university the red line are houston area high school students in diverse high schools and the green line are undergraduate and graduate social work students um, at universities across colleges and universities across the country so these were all separate studies. Um, so in some ways they had several of them that have separate items, which is why you don't see three bars for each of these questions. But what I wanted to look at here for today is to look at what are some common themes across all of these studies, despite some very different samples, okay? And in the, the college and university samples, these were students who almost entirely voted as well because they were online surveys and who answered online surveys about political participation. Um, but my high school students were in classrooms, paper, and are often in this sample, I think is much more likely to include non-voters in it, and my data suggests that. So across these very different samples, there's a few key themes that speak out to me here. Okay? First of all, technology, using the internet, online platforms for expressing views and following candidates are a part of these youth political activity. Youth are engaging in expressive political activities persuading others how to vote, expressing political views, and displaying campaign paraphernalia. And there's also a sizable 
involvement in political consumerism. As I mentioned before, using boycotting, bycotting, these consumer choices to try to influence how companies behave. So moving forward, um, while less traditional, maybe more increasingly online, activist-oriented activities are interesting, interesting use right now, voting is still is an important mechanism. For, for policy change. So a growing body of research over the last decade or so indicates that higher education could play a critical role in impacting participation. Now, I think it's important to acknowledge, as I showed, there's a very disproportionate low, lower, disproportionately lower level of participation among non-college students. I'm gonna talk for the last section here about what college campuses can do, but a lot, many of these can be applied in high school, even junior high setting, and middle school settings, but also by community-based youth organizations as ways to engage youth. So one does to think about in what ways can, the, can those of us who are either educators, young people ourselves, or working with young people, what can we do to encourage broader political engagement? So their political, sci political science, um, Sydney Verba and colleagues have developed a civic volunteer volunteerism model. It's actually been around for about 20 years now. This suggests there's three elements that precede political participation. Resources, having the time, money, knowledge, or skills to participate. Having psychological engagement, which really means being interested, feeling like you can make a difference, confident that you can, and being recruited to so I'm going to talk about some particular strategies with this in mind. So my, first of all, civic instruction, having course content related to government and influencing government across the curriculum, not just political science classes. We often sort of relegate government policy to political science classes, which means students who don't take political science don't get exposure to this, but also suggests that policy, government, is only the realm of political scientists and not of all of us. Um, but civic instruction classes that do this, classes that engage students in what we call deliberative course-based discussions, thoughtful, open discussions of diverse opinions around political events, these have both been linked in my own research and others with promoting skills and knowledge, but also increasing the extent to which students pay attention to candidates, actively demonstrate support for candidates, and engage in sustained, committed forms of political activity. That when we talk with our students about what government has to do with it, and this is not, again, just in politi political classes, we can talk about what, what, why, why, what, what do we need to understand in an architecture class about how policies are impacting the kinds of designs that we can make, for example, the kinds of building designs. That having these conversations can build engagement in our students. But we can also do campus-wide opportunities. These don't just need to be in the classroom to increase student access to electoral participation. Voter registration drives, like I mentioned, having clear access to on-campus voting, not just in presidential elections, but midterms and, and off years as well. And things like the upcoming GOP presidential debate that we're hosting here on this campus. I'm so excited to see this because I think that this is really a great opportunity for us to engage students in building skills and knowledge around politics. Okay, so I, you know, I, I think this is a great opportunity that I hope we take advantage of. So I want to illustrate how important this need for civic knowledge and skills is, and what we can do about this by this this picture here. Um, so during the Graduate College of Social Work's voter registration drive a few weeks ago, a local community organization lent us a voting booth to display, and I was really surprised at first as students kept walking by and saying, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? It's a voting booth, of course. Then I realized that lots of our students don't know what the physical act of voting looks like. This is important. If you don't know what it looks like to vote, how are you gonna feel confident to go in and vote? It's scary, it's intimidating. Yeah, I'm supposed to do it, but what does it look like? It's not that hard to borrow a voting booth and show students have those kinds of things present on campus. That was a huge eye-opener for me to see where those civic knowledge is, can be lacking. Okay. Psychological engagement. Practicing political school skills in the classroom has been linked repeatedly in research with political efficacy, meaning increasing students' ability to see that they get to believe that they can make a difference politically. 
deliberative discussion, the engaging in diverse opinions and having conversations, the kind of controversial discussions I grew up having in my classroom, but often, and we know this, educators are more and more scared to have in our classrooms, these have consistently been linked with political interest. But I also want to highlight that here, as young people are engaging in expressive activities, these emerging online activities, they are building interest. They are building efficacy. And if we treat them separate from electoral avenues for change, we're not helping them transition that interest and efficacy over. I think it's important that we not do what I've done before and say, oh no, let's not do a petition. Let's try for something that's really going to get you change. But talk about why what they've done when signing and creating a petition is actually really a good first step and part of a larger package that can help them feel more confident in their ability to make change. So I want to show a couple quick pictures of what this looks like in action, some examples of experiential activities for the GCSW. The picture on the top left is of students live tweeting a Senate candidate debate here on campus hosted by KUHF. A group of my students who would not, not otherwise have even turned on the debate that, le that night or listened to the debate had an opportunity to sit in a room and live tweet the entire debate. Let me tell you, this was an awesome activity to watch because the students were paying attention to the words the candidate said, typing up and you know, learning to translate, something that we think about in the classroom, how do you translate ideas into say it clearly and concisely. Um, so they were translating these ideas, but they were also stopping and thinking about what the candidates were saying. And as, as the night went on, I watched them kind of pull up separate computer screens and research things candidates said, wanting to be more interested in learning more about what candidates were saying as they were tweeting. This was an excellent opportunity to engage students in what was going on and to help them build interest the, you know, in the political process. You don't have to sit in that room over at KUHF. We can do this through a classroom assignment. You can do this at home. But these are, but having students pay attention and have this be part of what they're doing is really, I think, was incredibly successful for me to watch um, and see from our students. And the picture on the right is a trip to Austin for students to learn more about the legislative process and meet informally with legislative staff. Um, and the bottom picture, something I'm really excited about, is we held a lunchtime seminar a few weeks ago um, with a local Republican representative, Sarah Davis, um, to learn about state policy decisions around women's health and how those impact social work practice. We had a packed room. We had over 90 students. I've never seen over 90 people show up for a lunchtime seminar, speaker at, uh, around, around policy issues, and they showed up to hear what social workers show up to hear, what does this have to do with me? What does it have to do with my clients? And that connection between policy and what we're learning in the classroom, these weren't students showing up for a policy class. These were students who weren't forced to be in here, but interested in what does this mean for the kind of work that I'm doing? And finally, being recruited to participate. So in research, we know that people who are asked to vote are more consistently likely to do so. Being asked to vote makes huge difference. So the Pew Research Center um, did some research and looked at who was contacted by campaigns. Young adults, young voters are less likely to be contacted by campaigns than older adults. This is through printed mail and phone calls. That makes sense. I kind of expect that older adults are going to get more phone calls and printed mail. But emails and text messages older adults receive from campaigns more than young voters do. Technologically advanced generation here, spending all, uh, lots of time on text messages, and candidates aren't using that technology to contact young adults. It's older adults being contacted still. So here we have an example of where young adults are not being asked to vote. My own research finds that opportunities for personal contact between campaigns and college students can increase their involvement in political activity. So not just emails, text messages, but personal contact too. So these are things that we can help facilitate on a college campus. We can ask students to participate directly in the political process, and we can facilitate opportunities for personal contact with campaigns and candidates. I want to be clear here, I'm not talking about asking students to support a particular candidate or party. I'm talking about asking students, facilitating opportunities for students to engage with politics, with candidates, with campaigns. This is where, again, I think this debate is an incredible opportunity for students to engage with candidates across the spectrum. We can bring in candidates in class to talk about different issues or candidates from multiple sides or, in, sides or to the campus for various campus events. 
but asking students facilitating these opportunities I think is important. We can also ask students to observe election related news and events and share analysis of these issues in their classroom or in their assignments. And again, we might be thinking, okay, political science can do that. But think about this. We can ask students to review candidates' plans for addressing transportation problems through the lens of an engineering approach we studied in class. Why not? We can, in hospitality management, in a hospitality management course, we can ask students to examine candidates' tax plans through the lens of a small restaurant owner. Look at what would these plans mean? And what are these plans? How do these plans differentially impact me? Why should I care about these issues? So this picture is where I want to conclude. This is what happened after my students live tweeted the Senate candidate debate. These are two of our graduate college of social work, two of my students, meeting and talking with then Senate candidate Ted Cruz. My students had a face-to-face -face conversation with a candidate who is now a senator, who is now a candidate for president. This happened because we participated in live tweeting the debate and they had this opportunity to have this conversation. And I think this is part of not everybody can meet a senator or presidential candidate, but these are the kinds of things, whether it's on a federal level or state level or local level, that these kind of contacts, those students are always gonna think about politics differently because they had the opportunity to meet one of these people we usually just see on TV. And so to effectively facilitate millennials' political involvement, I think, first of all, we need to see the potential within millennial, the evidence of youth interested in speaking out about political issues and seeking out new ways to do so. The research suggests that we definitely need to also be aware of the challenges that youth face. And I think we also need to take seriously the role that universities, that research shows that universities can play in strengthening the involvement of college attending youth and how can we extend that to non-college youth as well. So thank you. You had a question earlier. Yeah, I was wondering on the, um, I think on the first or second graph, I think the line graph where you had like voter, um, I guess, student number of young people that voted, I think it was a percentage. Yeah, it wasn't, it was like the very first or second one, the line graph picture. This one? Uh, no, not that one. It wasn't divided by ethnicity, I think. No, not that one. Was that the first one? <laughs> 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 Which one are you, what was on it? Well, um, it, was just, it, it didn't have a range of years. It was just um, history year of 1972, I guess, yeah. The one with the ra race no, no, on just, just in general. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah, I think this was the one. Okay. So notice that like every 20 years or so, there's a spike in um, voting, voting, or about 20, every 20 years, not exactly 20 years for the last mm -hmm. for 2008. Mm -hmm. So is there, do you know of any factors or like any political or, or otherwise that would lead to a su su sudden spike about every 20 years? Well, so I don't know the regularity, but what I can tell you about these is so the first one is 1972, which is the first year that you know, that um, 18 to 21 year olds had the right to vote. The next big spike, I think, is 1992. Yeah, so with, about 20, every 20 years. So Bill Clinton ran for president, was one of the candidates, and he had very strong appeal among young voters and made it a point to reach out to young voters. So he went on MTV, he played saxophone on TV, he did a lot of things that were about using language and present in presentation and where he was to appeal and to speak to millennials. So I think there was a particular, talking about asking, there was a particular outreach on the part of the campaign to young adults. The next time we really see that spike again was the 2008 presidential, uh, President Obama's campaign in particular, which did very similar kinds of things, talked about, reached out to young adults in its strategy, the campaign strategy in the Obama campaign particularly was very much about engaging youth, engaging people, kind of friends together to engage. I was on uh, at, at in, in my doctoral program at the time and teaching undergrads about political engagement, how many of them were involved in the Obama campaign with friends, with groups, kind of spreading this out in Constellation, which was really a design of the campaign. But also he was talking about issues that resonated with young adults. Um, when he talked about healthcare, I saw my students come back in the classroom and talk about the experiences and the struggles they'd seen. Um, they talked about some of what he talked about, about college affordability, other kinds of things that were resonating. So I think that that's a piece of it too. I don't know, I think we're also talking about specific campaigns and candidates that have made particular outreach to young adults during those times. Are other questions? Did you have a question? Okay, well, can we please thank um, 
Suzanne. Senate Community and Government Relations Committee, so what an appropriate talk. Um, this is just a gift to thank you, Faculty Senate, and thank you so much for this amazing talk. Very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you.